Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. Hey, I'm Tia, and I'm from Carbondale, Colorado, which is also where my chilling story occurred. Because of what I went through, I don't allow my children to tent camp in our backyard. It makes me sad that I have to be strict about that. But I haven't been able to trust the woods ever since I discovered that unexplainable entities exist. I was once very close with a girl named Sally. I thought of her as the perfect friend. She was pretty, upbeat, and loved everything involving nature. We were only 10 years old when she convinced her father to set up their tent for us in their backyard. If I remember correctly, her family was preparing for a camping trip that upcoming weekend, and I suppose she was too excited to wait a few more days before she could sleep outside. Although Sally had been on camping trips in the past, she had never camped in a tent. Her family owned an RV and used it several times to travel across the country. But it felt like sleeping inside a small house, the family decided to do something a little more rustic for their upcoming camping excursion. Perhaps it wasn't until then that Sally's parents had decided she was old enough and mature enough to handle being out in a tent for the duration of the night. They probably thought she would get too creeped out by the sounds of scavenging animals. So they held off until she was a bit older and would understand there was no such thing as monsters in the woods. Well, it's a shame that she and I had to learn there is. In fact, something much more frightening than black bears out there. Sally's family had a spacious backyard, so in theory, it should have been an excellent location to familiarize ourselves with tent camping. I remember rushing with her to the tent right after dinner and immediately started gossiping about our classmates. Since it was summer, we talked about what the cutest boys had been up to since the school year had ended. Sally was a lot less shy around boys than I was at that age. So I recall feeling very entertained by her filling me in on the details of what they were up to. Her older brother worked as a lifeguard at a local pool, and she spent most of her afternoons there, the most popular hangout spot for boys and girls around our age. It was right around the time that Sally had revealed a surprising crush that we were confronted by a second, much more alarming surprise. The combination of multiple flashlights and electronic lanterns enabled us to see silhouettes of anyone or anything approaching the tent. But what we observed made it difficult to distinguish whether it was man or animal. At first, I assumed it was some kind of creature because it appeared to be moving on four feet and looked significantly smaller than a child. We couldn't tell if it grew before our eyes or rushed toward the tent at remarkable speed, creating the illusion that it was growing taller. Neither of us heard the footsteps. If the thing had been silent while moving about the ground, it would have helped the impression that it was also increasing in size. Also, I recall how the environment seemed to go entirely quiet, soon before the silhouette appeared. The whole thing was so mysterious and occurred before I had any idea that monsters existed. Although we both managed to remain quiet, I think it's safe to assume we would have screamed our little hearts out had we not felt so disturbed. 
the creepy figure appeared to leave the scene seconds after appearing, but Sally and I stayed quiet, hoping it was gone for good. Well, it wasn't. Only moments later, it reappeared, but this time, when it neared the tent, it made a strange sniffing noise. The sounds of those sniffs indicated that this was indeed an animal, though it was tough to figure out what kind. All we knew was that it was considerably larger than Sally and I combined. At one point, it looked like the intruder grew something out of its head, shaped like rabbit ears, which occurred immediately before the silhouette appeared to shrink again. I can't even begin to express how oddly it moved. Nothing about its motions resembled movement from anything I had ever seen before. It was almost like watching an old silent film with many damaged frames making it look like the characters were skipping from one place to the next. There were quite a few instances where Sally or I could have unzipped the tent's window screen and gotten a good look at the intruder, but we were both too frightened by the response that it might bring about. The other terrifying aspect was that we couldn't know whether the intruder knew we were in there. I figured it must have heard us gossiping earlier, which was probably why it snooped around in the first place. But then I wondered if it was merely attracted by the glow radiating from inside the tent. Without Sally's permission, I turned off the flashlight and the electric lantern before she could protest. That was when we started hearing bizarre noises. It sounded a lot like a human cackle, but the strange part was how I couldn't get a handle on whether it was a male or female voice. Frankly, it seemed to fluctuate between the two. Hearing those noises left us with even more questions. Not only were we wondering why the intruder had shown up in the first place, but what did it want with us? Why did it repeatedly approach our tent? Soon, the cackles seemed to circle us at an incredible speed. The terror quickly escalated to the point where neither of us could take it anymore. Simultaneously, we screamed as loud as we could, and it wasn't long before we heard Sally's father calling out to us as he approached. But before he even made it over to us, he started hollering at someone or something else. Hey, he called out. Who are you? What are you doing on my land? There was something about hearing him acknowledge the intruder that instantly made things feel even more real. I wanted to believe it was nothing more than a horrible dream, but Sally's father's startled reaction made it known it was anything but. Soon, it sounded like her dad ran in another direction following the intruder. A bit later, my heart nearly jumped out of my chest when we suddenly heard Sally's father's voice only feet away from our tent. Fortunately, the man sounded unharmed but out of breath as we stepped out of the tent. He asked us if we had seen that thing. I thought it was creepy to hear him say that he didn't even know whether it was a man or an animal. He said it was too dark to even tell if it was a man or a woman, while in a more human-like form. In any case, he was disturbed by the sighting and rushed us inside the house. Sally's father kept looking around as we walked through their dark backyard. It was apparent that he felt threatened by the intruder, which freaked me out even more. Sally's father wasn't a small guy, so it felt weird to see him that scared. It made him seem childlike in a way. Sally's mother immediately called the police as soon as her father informed her of what had happened. I remember him saying something about how he needed to ensure the kidnapper never came around again. The word kidnapper made the whole thing even more frightening because Sally's father interpreted the intruder as a serious threat. 
I was so glad he came out there when he did. Otherwise, who knows what would have happened to us. The police officers got to work as soon as they arrived. They spent the next 30 minutes searching for the trespasser, but failed to come up with anything. They even had difficulty locating tracks that might have belonged to another human. And they should have been able to find something of the sort because I remember them talking about how the soil was soft due to the recent storm. It wasn't until after the police left that we overheard Sally's parents discussing what her father had seen. He told his wife that he had seen a strange-looking person wearing an even stranger-looking outfit comprised of animal skin. Additionally, he saw what looked to be rabbit ears atop their head. He thought he was losing his mind as he watched the ears shrink until they were no longer visible. It was easy to tell that he was very disturbed and desperate for reassurance that he hadn't gone insane. Everything he told Sally's mother matched perfectly with the silhouettes we saw multiple times from inside the tent, which was alarming. I wished he had said he saw a homeless man running away from the property, even though that would have also been frightening. The idea that we had encountered something possibly half-human and half-animal made everything far more terrifying. Although it will probably remain unclear for the remainder of my life, I'm confident that we encountered a skinwalker that night. For many years, I tried to convince myself it was a ridiculous theory, but after reading so many books, full of strange encounters, I realize there's so much more in our woods than science declares. It genuinely feels like a disservice to humanity how the authorities don't warn us that we can encounter things in our forests that aren't widely talked about. It makes me sad to think how some parents are entirely unaware of the danger they're putting their children in by allowing them to roam free in their woodland backyard. No matter how hard they fought me, I would never let my kids do such a thing. What would have happened had that creepy trespasser gotten their hands on Sally and me? I highly doubt we would have ever been seen again. Please be careful while enjoying our beautiful outdoor environment. They're not as safe as most of us like to believe. On to the next one. Two cowboys see and chase the solitary savage of Snake River. Two cowboys just came in from Camas Prairie related an experience which will probably go a great way towards reestablishing the popular faith in the wild man's tradition. On the first day of this month, two cowboys searching for cattle lost in a storm passed over some lava crags and were startled by suddenly seeing before them the form so often described to them. They were so terrified that they sat up on their horses, looking at it in dread, mustering courage and drawing their revolvers. They dismounted and gave chase, but the strange being skipped from crag to crag as nimbly as a mountain goat. After an hour's pursuit, both young men were so utterly worn out that they both laid down, seeing which the wild man gradually approached them and stopped on the opposite side of the gorge in the lava, from which point he regarded the cowboys intently. The latter would be not shot, as they considered it would be unjustifiable, though they kept their pistols ready for use. While carefully returning, the compilement thoroughly inspecting the Phantom of Snake River, the wild man was considerably over six feet in height, with great muscular arms which reached to its knees. The muscles stood out in great knots, and his chest was broad as that of a bear. Skins were twisted about his feet and ankles and a wolf skin about his waist. All parts of his body to be seen were covered by long black hair, while from his head the hair flowed over his shoulders in coarse, tangled rolls 
and mixed with a heavy beard. His face was dark and swarthy, and his eyes shone brightly, while two tusks protruded from his mouth. His fingers were in the shape of claws with long, sharp nails, and he acted very much as a wild animal, which is unaccustomed to seeing a man. The boys made all kinds of noises, at the sounds of which he twisted his head from side to side and moaned. Apparently, he could not give them any back talk. So, weary-eyed of him, the two boys fired their revolvers, whereupon the wild man turned a double somersault and jumped fifteen feet to a low bench and disappeared, growling terribly as he went. It is supposed that this is the same apparition that has so often been seen before. The man no doubt does as the Indians did for substance and lives on camas root, which grows wild in the area. And he no doubt kills young stock as many yearlings and calves disappear mysteriously and nothing but skeletons are ever found. The boys at the stock camp are arranging to go out on scout again, overtake him, being provided with lariat. They will also lasso him and bring him to Haley to deliver him upon the county authorities. This article was printed by River Press, November 1st, 1882. On to the next one. In Lata County in Idaho near Troy. I only remember it was near the top of the mountain. My incident took place during the summer. I was eight years old at the time. It took place on Moscow Mountain. I believe it was the south side of the mountain. A small mountain near Troy, Idaho. Moscow, Idaho is not too far from Troy. Moscow being the State University of Idaho. From time to time, I would ride with my father to his work site. He would buy what is or was referred to as a stumpage site. This site would be a small area that the Forest Service would award to someone through a bidding process. The person which the contract was awarded to would then be responsible to clean the area of brush. My father did this to obtain the old growth cedar on the site. He would then reduce the trees into posts and rails and sometimes into shake roofing shingles. On one particular morning, at approximately 10 to 11 a.m., my father and I were on the site. My father began to notch out a cedar that was approximately five feet across. He had real difficulty falling this tree because it had a lot of papery material inside of it. About halfway through the falling process, my father pulled the saw out of the tree and shut it off. In the meantime, I kept getting a feeling that something was staring at me. I had not yet talked to my father yet about my odd feeling because he always had me stand behind another tree, hopefully the opposite side of the direction the tree was supposed to fall. He was an excellent tree faller. After he shuts his chainsaw off, he looked over to me and said, I feel like something is staring at me. I said, I think it's an elk. He said, no. I think that there is a cub bear up in the cedar snag. He gave me directions to walk around the tree to look up and watch for the cub bear. He did the same, only he walked in the opposite direction. Neither one of us saw a cub bear up in the tree. He then said to me, you must be right, it's probably an elk. Sometimes I could find elk that thought they were hidden when I would get this feeling. My father proceeded to fall the cedar snag it fell on a slope, which was thickly covered with brush that was almost as tall as I was. As soon as the tree quit moving, I ran up its trunk. I had gotten about halfway up the tree's length. At that moment, something jumped up on the tree with me. It was about the same height as I stood. It stopped in front of me, looked me right in the face. Its face was about eight inches from mine. I let out as my father put it, a blood-curdling scream. It took off on its legs, similar to the way a human would run. It went toward the top part of the tree and disappeared. I, on the other hand, could not get back to my father soon enough. My father approached me and said, I think you saw a cub bear. I responded with, no, dad, I saw a big monkey. 
we did not talk another word about it. I believe my father thought my mother would blow a gasket if she found out what had happened. This episode took place during a mostly clear, warm summer morning. The following Monday, I told my story to my third grade teacher. She later contacted someone at Moscow, Idaho State University, so as to find out if any circus animals had escaped or been lost in the area. She later told me that no animals had escaped or been lost from a circus. What prompted her to take these actions was the fact I had told her that I thought it looked like a chimpanzee, only bigger. I was small for my age until I hit my teen years, but it was about my size. Only heavier built, much more muscular. Its face looked just like a chimpanzee's. Its fur was clean, short, and shiny. It had a clean and neat look about it. This is my story, and I swear on my father's grave that everything that I have told you is true. My father started to take his .30-06 hunting rifle with him to his job sites after that time. He usually worked alone. At that time, our neighbor Jean ranged beef cattle on Moscow Mountain. These cattle would turn wild. One had to be careful when hiking around the mountain because these cattle would charge people. They acted as if something had harassed and chased them. This incident occurred between 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. The skyline was mostly clear, only a few clouds. The air temperature was pleasant and warm. My father and I were also in a clear area because the trees were far apart from one another because of an eerie logging operation that took place who knows when. It was forested with mostly red firs and some cedar groves here and there. There was also a lot of brush in the area. On to the next one. In Owahi County in Idaho, myself and five members of my family witnessed a strange event while we were out rabbit hunting after dark on a warm and clear night in the spring. It has been so long ago, but I do remember that we had not been drinking. The hunt had started out earlier in the day, about 30 to 45 miles west of Canyon County. We were having so much fun that we continued to headlight and spotlight hunt on into the night. I'm not sure if we had one or two vehicles. We eventually pulled off Mud Flat Road onto a small dirt road to take a break and stretch. We had passed through some flat farmland and were now in a large and heavy growth of sagebrush, a few miles from the base of Oahe Mountain. I continued to use the spotlight while we were stopped. I pointed in a southeasterly direction, first close in and then moved it higher to look for rabbits and coyotes. It was then that I saw this large upright thing. It was running away from us at a distance. I called everyone's attention to it and we watched as it left over sagebrush and other large obstructions. It ran like a man and it never hesitated or looked around and finally disappeared into a gully. We all tried to ascertain what it was we saw. Our total conclusion was that it was like no other wild or range animal which we had ever seen. We did not drive over to look for any footprints as the car was usable on roads only. Chasing after it with flashlights was never mentioned or considered as we would not have felt comfortable approaching it with minimal light sources in the dark. We felt more than a little anxiety over the prospect. We ended the hunt, and on our way back home, we were all very quiet and lost in our own thoughts. We all decided that this creature was upright as a man would be, and quite tall. It was well after darkness had set in. The area was sagebrush, bordering farms, pretty flat, but too rough to farm. Well, at maybe two to three miles from the beginning of the juniper pine stand, and five miles before reaching the true base of a wacky mountain. On to the next one. This was in Bing in Pontotoc County in Oklahoma. I was eight years old and we had just moved to the country that had lots of woods all around the house. We had a little camper I played in. 
I had several chihuahuas and a Rottweiler. Well, one day I was playing in the camper and the dogs were barking, running just a little way from where I was. I decided to follow them. What came after was cute. It was a little fawn. I was going to chase it, but I saw this huge, smelly, eight-foot-tall, red mud-clay color thing. As little as I was, I thought it was a tall man until I hollered, Hey, who are you? He looked at me, and his face was so ugly and scary, I knew then he wasn't a man. He stepped right over a five-foot-five fence. The little fawn ran right under it. He didn't catch the fawn. I was in shock, and I couldn't speak, so my dad told me to draw what I saw. He said it looked similar to a Sasquatch. That deer season, my dad was hunting deer. He had a deer right next to him. He was about to shoot him, and he heard something coming towards him. The buck ran off. My dad stood up and yelled, You scared my deer off. You're on my land. He heard a high-pitched sound like a lion and a bull mixed together and heard branches breaking over his head. He ran to the house and got both my brothers. They each got a gun. My mom called the sheriff and he thought it was a prank, but they sent a deputy anyway. When he had heard those sounds, he said, call me if you kill it and left. Now it was dark. The sun had set, so they gave up. The rest of the night, it paced back and forth, making that high-pitched sound. He killed two missing goats. He usually comes back every deer season in the fall. The sighting was just me. My mom, dad, and both my brothers, and my sister, my deputy, my grandpa, and both aunts heard it. The afternoon was sunny with no wind. The area was heavily wooded with lots of deer in a creek bottom near the river. He was standing in a wash. When you go to the river, there is a hole in the big drainage system. It smells just like it. It's as tall as he is. Around the corner where my grandma lived, they heard something digging in their trash and the smell was like sewage. On to the next one. Near Norman in Cleveland County in Oklahoma. Lake Thunderbird is a little river preserve and very wooded on one side of the river near Franklin Road. I went fishing with a friend at Lake Thunderbird about six years ago. We started fishing in the afternoon. As the day went on, we stayed till it got into the evening. As we were fishing later in the evening, me and my friend started hearing strange noises from the other side of Little River, which runs into the lake. It sounded like a very large man breathing, and it was getting closer to us. Then, me and my friend started to notice the animals around us were going the other way from the noise. It made me think there is something out there, and it is coming this way. I started to get very nervous because we could hear branches breaking, and it was getting closer to the other side of the river. I became real nervous when my friend said, Look at all the birds flying the opposite way and in a hurry. Then we heard a loud splash in the water and we figured it was time to go. That something was very upset with our presence in the area. I told all my friends about it and they thought I was crazy. And to this day, I've never been back that area to fish. I have grown up in the south side of Oklahoma all my life towards the lake and have never heard anything like that before, and will never forget the sound it made and the animals running away. I also noticed the branches I could see on the other side of the riverbank breaking above my head, and I knew there was nothing I'd ever seen that could do that. It was a typical fall night, but not cold yet. A lot of people say they heard noises outside at night in the area. It is a deep river, and on a known deer hunting area. On to the next one. Choctaw County in Oklahoma. My cousins and I were spotlighting one night to find coyotes. We were driving alongside a tree line 
when we spotted eyes shining in the light about 150 feet away next to the trees. I had binoculars and one of my cousins had a 22 Magnum with a scope. We had a very good view of a large biped covered with brown hair, except for white patches on its pecs and one of its arms. It was about eight feet tall or more. It tilted its head down because of the light, but stayed in place for about five minutes, then stepped across the fence on the tree line and disappeared into the woods. The face was like a man and an ape. There were four or five witnesses. We were all riding in a pickup truck. I was 18. They ranged in age from 12 to 16. It was a clear, calm night between 8 p.m. and 10 p.m. It was in a clear pasture next to a heavily wooded area. This is not the first round here. It was my second sighting. And I have pictures of footprints somewhere. On to the next one. In the Chickasaw National Recreation Area, which is quite easy to find as it is the only national park in Oklahoma. It is located in the City of Sulphur off Highway 7 in Murray County in Oklahoma. It was on Halloween night. I had taken my younger brother, a high school senior at the time, to a veteran's lake inside the Chickasaw National Recreation Area because some of his friends from the high school band were going to meet that night to try to see the Lady of a Lake, a local myth. As we went to the lake, I was rather preoccupied with the conversation I was having with my brother, so I did not pay close attention to the events going on around us, if any. After dropping him off to hang out with his friends, I left to return home. As I drove back down toward the 12th Street entrance to park, I drove over the Rock Creek Bridge, which crosses the Rock Creek just a few yards south of the Rock Creek Campground. As I drove over the Low Water Bridge, I saw a figure squatted at the edge of the creek, about 20 yards east, downriver from the bridge. It was quite large, at least four and a half to five feet tall in the squatting position. I drove down a little ways and turned the car around. I went back to the bridge and pulled to where my headlights would shine down the creek as well as possible. It was still there. It was on the balls of its feet with its hands in the water. The creature was huge and hairy. The dark hair was shiny in the car light, but it was hard to make out the exact color. For what was only a few seconds, I'm sure, but it seemed like at least 15 minutes, I watched this creature. It did not even glorify my presence with a glance. It merely rose up, walked across the creek, up the bank, and off into the trees. What amazed me the most was that there are streetlights along that park road, and the city of Sulphur is only about a half a mile away. There are streetlights nearby, and I used my car light to see the creature better. The weather was quite chilly as it was late autumn. I remember a very cool breeze blowing that night. The park has areas of woodland with pines, plus it is close to Arbuckle Mountain. On to the next one. Near Dover in Kingfisher County in Oklahoma. The closest water is Turkey Creek. The closest road is Red Fork Drive. It was the middle of the day and a couple of friends and I went four-wheeler riding. We rode up into the north end of the land that I live and seen a deer take off running to our northwest. Surprise, we rode up to the fence and in the field to our north, just on the edge of the tree line, we saw something dark walking to the west. The creature was somewhere around seven to eight feet tall with black fur from head to toe. It walked slightly hunched over. Needless to say, we didn't sit and watch for long. We hauled butt back to the house. It was the middle of the day and around 80 to 90 degrees out. All three of us are certain that what we'd seen couldn't have been a man in a suit. How many people are seven to eight feet tall around here? This is the only sighting I have. However, 
I have heard something that scared the bleep out of me. I had two fairly large dogs three years ago. A German shepherd I kept on a chain and a large chow that ran free. One night, I was lying in bed at around 1.30 at night and I heard my dog barking like crazy. They didn't bark for too long because about 15 seconds of them barking, I heard this loud growl. Immediately after that growl, there was nothing but silence outside. I'd like to say I looked out the window to see what it was, but I was too busy laying extremely still under the covers while my heart was pounding. I can't say what it was that growled, but my dogs were big and defensive of things coming onto the property, so whatever got both of them to shut up in an instant surely had to be pretty scary. At the time, I was 17. I'm now almost 20, and I still wholeheartedly believe that there is something out there in the trees that I'd hate to run into in the middle of the night. This is a huge area of trees and brush just along the creek northwest of my house. It is very possible that something could survive in the area without being seen by too many people. And dozens of turkeys pass through this area every year that the creature could feed off of. On to the next one. My encounter with the Sasquatch species happened back in 1999 while I was canoeing the, the Stillaguamish River in Washington State. I was with my son, who was in high school at the time, and this incident is something we still talk about to this day. Frankly, I've always thought the event to have brought us closer together. My son went through a phase where he was really into the sport of kayaking. We're from the state of Michigan, and until he was old enough to drive, we spent many summer weekends kayaking various rivers within the state. Even though he had a lot of fun on those trips, he would often mention how he wanted to paddle some extraordinary river out in Colorado or the Pacific Northwest. Well, when his birthday rolled around, I surprised him with the itinerary for a trip to Washington for that upcoming month of June. The kid was ecstatic, and it was an overwhelmingly satisfying feeling to see just how much joy that gift brought his way. Of course, I had no clue that this trip would be more memorable for a variety of reasons. My wife has never been much of an outdoorsy type, but she was always very encouraging of my son and I to get out there and enjoy what nature has to offer. And even though she wasn't interested in participating, she was extremely supportive and would ask our son to tell her all about the trips. I want to say we had been camping in Washington for nearly a week and had already completed three kayaking trips before we embarked on our journey down the Stillaguamish River. For whatever reason, we decided to switch things up a bit by renting a canoe rather than the duo of a single-person kayak. This way, we were aboard the same vessel, which made it easier to maintain discussion as we observed and admired our surroundings. Those kinds of trips are truly perfect for bonding with your loved one. There seems to be something about being immersed in nature that spark great conversation. It encourages you to drop your guard and speak up about any insecurities you might have. It's probably needless to say that a barrage of anxieties often torments teenagers, and this was when I learned from my son that he was embarrassed by how small he was in comparison to so many of the other boys his age. Luckily, I was able to communicate to him that I went through the same thing at his age, but would end up going through a growth spurt only a year later. Something that I should mention would end up happening for him around the same time. If you're parenting teenagers as you listen to this, I highly recommend you take them on this type of journey. I think it's inevitable that you'll grow even closer. Anyway, enough of why we were on this trip. Allow me to explain 
what made this journey unforgettable. We had been paddling for a couple of hours, and I want to say we were a little less than halfway finished with the route. I can vividly recall how our dialogue was abruptly interrupted by the sounds of birds fleeing from a couple of trees that were off to the right side of the river. Both of us swiveled our heads in the direction of the commotion and immediately saw the multiple dark shapes that were running along the terrain that was only a little bit above the riverbank. Of course, our paddling came to a halt. At first, I could only assume we were looking at a large group of black bears. However, I knew enough about bears to know that they weren't pack animals. Additionally, though, these entities were on four limbs. They weren't moving in the ways that bears do. There was something about the limbs that reminded me of the way monkeys run through the treetop. It was very nimble. From where our canoe was positioned, there looked to be at least ten of these creatures. Their feet didn't seem to make much noise when they touched the terrain, but we were able to hear a series of strange grunts, growls, chirps, and even whistles. The noises that these creatures made didn't resemble anything I had ever heard before. Although it was clear that they were heading in the same direction as us, one would sometimes circle another one and nudge it with its hand or torso before resuming what almost seemed like a race. Whatever they were, they seemed like a very social bunch. I don't remember feeling very scared at the time. Perplexed would be the more appropriate word. However, there was something about my son's body language that made it obvious he was pretty intimidated by what we were seeing. Hey man, it's all right, I whispered to him. We're fine. They can't touch us while we're out here. But it was as I returned my gaze to the riverbank that I saw two of the entities were now standing in the water on two feet and looking at us in silence. I somehow hadn't even heard anything step into the water while I was speaking to my boy. Since there was now a length of about 40 yards between us and the physically intimidating creatures, my gut told me to start paddling closer to the opposite side of the river. However, another inner voice warned me that it wouldn't be wise to show my son that I was feeling frightened. On the other hand, I was quickly growing more and more worried about what I was supposed to do if these large creatures were to charge our canoe. Even with the other creatures continuing to move about in the backdrop, there was something about the two entities that stood in the water. They were just so stoic and statuesque. Another thing that sticks out in my memory is how there appeared to be an absence of color in the eyes. Of course, it could have been the distance that divided us from them, but they just looked like black marble. Both my kid and I agreed that their faces had human characteristics. To me, they looked like extra wide human faces with notably high foreheads. In other words, I suppose you could say they looked how I would imagine early humans to look. I wasn't able to make out what the contents of their mouths were like as their lips were closed. I'm not sure whether it was because the lips were so large, but the shape made it appear as though they were pouting. These things were as barrel-chested as can be, equipped with long but muscular arms. Since the lower portion of their legs were submerged, I was unable to see if the feet were as gigantic as some others say. The natural current of the river continued to take us further away from the creature, but it was probably around ten minutes later that we again spotted them running on all fours near the riverbank. I didn't mention it to my son, but I was becoming worried that we were their primary interest. I thought, what if they're hunting us? What could I possibly do to protect my teenage son? After that second sighting, we never would see them again. The idea of Bigfoot wasn't the first thing to cross my mind. I was well aware of the subject, but I suppose I grew up assuming there was only one of them, akin to the Loch Ness Monster. When I think back on it, 
That assumption was a bit ridiculous. How could there possibly be only one specimen out there? When we first spotted these entities racing through the woods, I guess I assumed we were looking at some other kind of rare species that hadn't been documented yet. It's never been clear to me whether it was because of that incident or not, but my son seemed to grow out of his kayaking obsession after that trip. However, it was at a point in his life where he started spending a lot more time with girls, so that could easily be the reason. Since then, my son and I have watched a boatload of documentaries that revolve around the subject. We've even met up at multiple conventions and would probably have done more if timing always permitted. Whenever I'm at those types of gatherings, I can't help but wonder how many attendees have had their own experiences with this species. That's an idea that always intrigued me. I don't think we'll ever know with a 100% certainty that we saw a group of Sasquatch that day. But all these years later, and I still have yet to come across a single practical explanation. Whatever they were, they must be at the very top of the food chain. On to the next story. My experience with the Bigfoot creatures happened nearly 20 years ago while I was living with my family in a small town in Wyoming that's in proximity to Yellowstone National Park. The funny thing is, I spent years of my childhood thinking that these animals were ghosts. Even though my parents weren't farmers, my dad couldn't pass up on what he said was a deal of a lifetime, which consisted of almost 18 acres of land which were once used for farming. Therefore, multiple structures on our property were used for various farming duties. My bedroom window looked out toward an old shed that was made of wood. This thing looked like it was about to collapse at any given moment. My parents thought that these old structures provided a lot of character for the land. They had always been passionate about purchasing antiques, and I just think they really liked the history that came along with some of those items. It was one night when I was probably around six or seven years old that I heard the door to the shed slapping against the doorframe. When I finally walked over to the window, I saw a very large, dark figure crouched just beyond the doorframe. It was one of those doors where, if you opened it, it would automatically swing closed. This creature was crouched with its back turned and kept casually nudging the door open as soon as it closed. Why it continued to do that, I don't have the slightest clue, but it was very eerie. At first, I thought I was seeing things because my parents used to remind me that our eyes can play tricks on us. But as I continued to look at this thing, I quickly recognized that I was as awake as ever. At this time, the figure never turned and looked my way, but there was still a very ominous feeling that washed over me and encouraged me to run to my parents' room to wake them up and ask them about what I was seeing. At first, they ignored me and told me to get back to bed, but I insisted that at least one of them come to my room to see what I was talking about. I remember holding my father's hand as he walked me over to my bedroom window and together we peered through the glass. As you might have guessed, there was nothing there and the shed door appeared to be closed and secure. Of course, my father tucked me back into bed and repeated his belief that it was nothing more than a bad dream. It was a frustrating feeling because I knew that I had seen something. It was just too large and just too real. When it was light outside the next morning, I somehow found the courage to walk with our dog over to the shed. At first, my dog wasn't acting weird or anything, but it wasn't long before she seemed to pick up on a scent that was a bit behind the shed. Her snout was essentially glued to the ground. It was clear that something was puzzling her deeply. It was rare that our dog 
ever wanted to go inside the house before we did, but this was one of those occasions I just couldn't understand what that creature would have been doing in the shed. It's not like we ever stored livestock or any kind of food in there. The only conclusion I could come to was that it was trying to either hide from someone or something, get warm, or nurse an injury. I often wish we had surveillance cameras installed in that shed so we could have seen what was going on inside there at night. Or perhaps the creature had left and shut the door behind it? It was a long time before I saw anything else after that. However, I did hear a bunch of strange noises in the middle of the night, all of which my father attributed to coyote. Although I was young, I was informed enough to know that these were no dang coyotes. It was about two years later, when I had my next encounter. I woke up to the sound of my parents arguing. I remember specifically how my dad was pacing up and down the hallway. It was as if he was trying to decide what he should do next. At first, I had no clue as to what they were talking about, but it quickly became evident they didn't want me to hear whatever it was. So, being the curious child I was, I placed my ear against the door and tried to get some sense for what the concern was. I remember hearing my dad say, there's nobody we can call about this kind of thing. It wasn't long after that that my mom mentioned how she would call the cops if my father didn't. It became obvious to me that my dad didn't want any attention on our property, at least of this nature. Even though they were trying to keep their voices down, their nervous demeanors sometimes changed the volume of their voices and I would be able to hear certain things, things that reminded me of that experience I had a few years back. My mother kept mentioning the word intruders. Whatever she was talking about, it was clear that she didn't want to acknowledge that these things as being anything other than human. But I could tell by my dad's tone that he had a different opinion on the matter. Eventually, they went back into their bedroom and closed the door, leaving me with little opportunity to hear anything further. To be completely honest, my parents had been doing a lot of arguing over the years, and I knew that certain issues between them were beyond the subject of these intruders. It was because of this that I didn't want to pry too much into their conflict. However, it was probably only a couple of days later when I was fishing with my dad that I asked him if someone had been trespassing on our property. His delayed response made it rather clear that there was something on his mind, but then he quickly tried to regain a look of confidence and informed me that everything was okay. Even at my young age, I was able to tell that something had managed to get under my father's skin, and there was something that was seriously worrying him. There was a while there where my father would quickly change the subject whenever I brought that whole topic up. And it's safe to say that my mother was no different. Not long after that, there was one night where I was awoken by what sounded like heavy breathing coming from below my window. However, this breathing didn't sound at all normal. It was as if whoever was responsible for it was incredibly sick like they were having extreme respiratory problems. I became so scared of the noise that I finally stepped out of my bed to tell my parents. But it was as soon as I stepped into the creaking floorboards that whatever was outside seemed to notice, and the breathing came to a halt. That freaked me out so much because it immediately gave me the impression that this thing had approached the outside of the house solely because it was interested in me. At one point, it had become a few minutes since I had heard those raspy breaths, so I decided to walk over to the window to see if I could see anything. At first, I was inclined to look toward the shed, but everything appeared normal. However, that was when I noticed the movement just to the left of the window. The dark shape had managed to blend in with the darkness and completely caught me by surprise. 
I couldn't help but let out a gasp, one that was apparently so loud that it provoked my parents to come running into my bedroom. It was very clear that they were already on alert due to what it was that they hadn't been disclosing to me. As I sat on the edge of my bed, I watched my father walk over to my window, his eyes widened, and that was when the three of us were forced to endure what was an eardrum-shattering scream. The noise was so deeply unpleasant, and it's not even something that I feel confident describing. What I can say is that I could feel it rattle my inside. Visibly distraught by the noise, my father started pounding on the wall right next to the window, obviously trying to scare off the intruder. Unfortunately, all this did was make the noise worse, and both the volume and pitch drastically increased. My mother had been using her hands to cover my ears, but it was when the noise worsened that she had no choice but to clutch her own. The noise was so agonizing that it provoked my father to start pounding his fist directly on the window out of desperation. That was when I watched the glass shatter and blood instantly began to flow down my dad's arm. It was soon after that that the horrible noise stopped. And aside from our own rustling, there was utter silence. Another thing that I often reflect on was how our dog was nowhere to be found during this incident. We later found her under the bed in my parents' room. It was incredibly challenging for my mom to convince her to come out from under there. And when I went to pet her, she was still shaking. That was when I demanded that my parents explain to me what the hell was going on. I remember both of them looking at each other, silently trying to establish who would be the one to speak. My mother sat me down at the kitchen table and put her hand on my back. She began to talk about how spirit from another world were visiting us, but they weren't in any way looking to harm us. However, I wasn't the dumbest of kids and quickly disputed her statement, asking why Dad had just been so insistent on driving these spirits away from the property. If they could do no harm, what difference did it make if they were lurking in or around our house? Additionally, why was it that our dog was so blatantly intimidated? With every one of my questions, there was pretty much only one way that they would respond, that no matter what, they would keep me safe. I remember feeling so helpless and vulnerable, like there was absolutely nothing I could do. If things were to get out of control and we were to be attacked, back then, it was just so hard to comprehend that my parents were as lost as I was regarding what was going on. I believe that is something that is incredibly challenging for any child to understand that their parents don't have all of the answers to what life throws at them. There was this one day where I got home from my friend's house earlier than expected and there was a vehicle in the driveway that I never saw before. When I entered the house, I saw an older man who seemed to be inspecting the wall while standing in the living room. He was holding a cross and muttering some dialogue that I couldn't make out. Whatever he was saying, he seemed pretty concerned. When my mother caught sight of me, she rushed over to my side and guided me to my bedroom. She then proceeded to inform me that the man who was downstairs was there to cleanse the house of any negative energy. I remember having trouble understanding what she meant by all of that. By that point in my life, I don't believe I had seen any movies like The Exorcist. I just hadn't been exposed to that type of ideology. It was especially strange because my parents weren't all that religious, and I think that that reinforces the idea that they were willing to try anything to understand the phenomena that was taking place around our property. Like I said, the priest didn't come off as very concerned for whatever energy he felt in our house. But we'd all soon come to find out that that had no direct correlation to the things that I had seen outside my window. At least, that's how I see it. A couple more weeks had passed by, and it was starting to seem as though my parents were feeling less stressed. I suppose 
That would mean that they had seen last evidence of whatever had been responsible for making them feel panicked. Even my dog, who I believed was very intuitive, was acting like her normal self. There was this one morning where I was walking with my mother and our dog through the various trails that surrounded the edge of our property. I remember I was in the middle of telling my mother about the latest episode of a television show when we saw this large figure lying halfway in the trail that we were walking in. I distinctly remember her hand pressing against my chest to prevent me from walking any further. That was when the dog started to whimper. Soon, those quiet whimpers transitioned into muffled growls before transitioning back to whimpers. It was as if she couldn't decide how to react to what lay maybe 30 yards before us. It was very hard to make out what this thing was, as it was lying in a fetal position with its back turned to us. It was massive. Even though I could see it was breathing, it was making no noise at this point. Something else that really stood out to me was how the long matted hair on this thing was like a cinnamon red brown color. This did not at all resemble whatever I thought I had seen outside my window, but there was always the chance that the time of day was responsible for altering my perception of color. As we began to back off, that when this thing became a little bit worrisome. Without looking at us, the figure rose onto all fours and swiftly scurried into the woods that surrounded the trail. Aside from the sound of crumbling vegetation, there seemed to be no other noise. I'm not exactly sure why, but this was when my dog started to lose her cool. She kept looking back at my mother and I, and it was like she was suggesting that we head back in the direction of our house. Her animalistic instincts were warning us that the environment was no longer safe, and we needed to get out of there as fast as possible. I have this haunting memory of my mother singing the song Old MacDonald. She was trying to instill confidence, even though her voice was jittering. If she hadn't been wearing sunglasses, I'm certain I would have seen tears in her eyes. She really was that frightened. This might sound weird, but the figure on that trail reminded me at the time of something you would see in the TV show Sesame Street. There are a few people who I've told about this who asked me if I smelled anything out of the ordinary whenever I was near these things. Mysteriously enough, I can't say I remember anything standing out. However, I am aware that many people report that kind of thing. Perhaps I was just too startled to notice. We made it back to the house without any complication, but I do often wonder what would have happened if my father were there with us. My father was so protective of his family that I sometimes wonder if he would have provoked the creature to pursue us. For all I know, it could have been a male that we saw, and it might have become territorial if it learned that an adult human male was in its vicinity. I've talked to quite a few other people who have had their own encounters with the Bigfoot species, and many of them have brought it to my attention that they can perceive the presence of an adult human male as a challenge. I remember when we made it back to the house, our dog immediately went into the laundry room and lay near her food and water dish for the next few hours. It was the strangest thing. She would go from acting calm and cool to beyond petrified once she saw any sign of those mysterious creatures. My father wasn't home when we returned, and this was back before any of us had cellular phone. Otherwise, I do not doubt that my mother would have called him and asked him to return home. Right away. When we saw that creature on the trail, I will go ahead and estimate that we were nearly half a mile from the house, which makes me feel very lucky that things didn't get out of hand we probably never would have been seen again. By the time my father finally returned home that day, my mother seemed to no longer care about what was said in front of me. She pleaded with my father to sell the property and move far away, preferably to an inner city environment. It was especially strange coming from my mother because she absolutely loved the countryside. That goes to show just how significant her fear 
of this had become. Even though my father was very concerned about my mother, it was clear that he felt as though he had invested way too much into that property. He just refused to be bullied by anyone or anything. Again, we ended up going quite a while without any scares. However, the final straw happened one evening a couple of years later. I remember it happened in the summer because I can distinctly recall the smell of barbecued chicken that we cooked outside on the charcoal grill. For whatever reason, that was something we only did during the summer. It's one of those smells that I continue to affiliate with the summer season. The rear of the home connected to one of those screened porches, and that was an area that we frequently lounged in whenever we had good weather. The three of us were sitting at the round table, enjoying the fresh barbecued food, when, all of a sudden, our dog began to bark incessantly. I can even remember how my fingers, as well as my face, were covered with barbecued sauce, as I turned my head to look in the direction of where she was barking. A female deer was right up against the screen, using a hoof to push inside. The deer ended up breaking the screen with ease, and it wasn't long before it was thrusting its torso through the opening. Our dog continuously pretended to lunge at the deer, but was never near vicious enough to deliver a bite. Neither of my parents had any time to react before we watched the dark figure rush in from the side of the house and grab the deer's hind legs, causing it to squeal out in anguish. The deer desperately squirmed to break free, but the struggle was no match for what I initially thought to be some kind of giant dog. This creature was pitch black, and it wasn't until it picked the deer up and ran off on two legs that I felt we were looking at a monster. It then ran off in the opposite direction, but I'll never forget how it turned around and looked at the three of us with this grin. That facial expression is something that still haunts me. There was something about it that looked so evil, so diabolical. It was as if this thing was far more intelligent than any animal. It had an agenda. To this day, I am convinced that that look was the primary reason my father agreed to leave the property for good. I can't say for sure, but I am fairly certain I saw more than one kind of species while living on that land. Although I never got a thorough look at their features during those earlier occasions, there was most definitely something different about what we saw attack the deer. I became so distraught about all these experiences, and it was truly a breath of fresh air when we moved to Boise, Idaho. My family went for years and years without discussing those matters. It was like we wanted to completely move on from the bad energy. It wasn't until years later, when I was listening to a friend from college talk about a UFO that they had allegedly seen a few nights earlier, that my interest in the paranormal returned. We got into a deep discussion, and I assured them that I believed their story due to having experienced crazy events of my own. We really bonded over these conversations. They were like therapy after having spent years of bottling up so much disturbing information. Having realized how good this was for my soul, I started to open myself back up to investigating that stuff. Still, I often wonder why I was giving the feeling that that creature was pure evil. But be careful while you're out in the woods. On to the next story. My name is Max, and I went through a terrifying experience in the late winter of 2004. It changed my life. I attended college at San Diego State University, and one of my close friends was a guy by the name of Elias. Elias was a foreign exchange student from Munich, Germany and he was extremely passionate about outdoor things like camping, hiking, cliff jumping. For his birthday, he requested that a couple of his other friends and I accompany him on a camping trip 
in a place that was probably about an hour inland from San Diego. Honestly, I can't remember the name of the location. All I do remember about it is that we parked at some random spot along the side of a winding road and headed up a steep incline just beyond where we parked our vehicles. I remember there were pine needles nearly everywhere along the steep path, which made it difficult for our boots to gain any traction along the walk. The place wasn't a designated campground, but rather a random wooded mountainous terrain that caught Elias's eyes while he once drove through the area. I thought it was a bit of a sketchy location when we first arrived, but we all went along with it because we all wanted our friend to enjoy his birthday. He just really seemed to like how there was a good chance that nobody else had ever camped there before. Luckily, it didn't take us very long to reach flat ground, and the place provided a beautiful but haunting view of many charred tree trunks. A few hundred yards behind those tree trunks was another incline that appeared to lead to the tip of the mountain peak. It was February, so I remember it started to get extremely cold and windy once the sun began to set. We had been so focused on drinking our beers that we hadn't even thought to start setting up the tents. We had no choice but to use all four sets of hands to get the things staked into the ground before they blew away. I believe we had nearly finished setting up the last of the tents when something screamed at us from above. My initial reaction was that some large bird was acting territorial because its nest was just above our tent. But it was as soon as the four of us looked up that we noticed a pair of eyes that appeared to reflect the moonlight. Instantly, I could tell that this was no bird. Actually, I thought it was some strange person who had climbed up there unnoticed. It was very odd, and it gave me such a weird feeling in the pit of my stomach. It was a sensation that I found very hard to describe. All I can say is that I knew something wasn't right. Something was very, very wrong, and I somehow knew that we shouldn't be anywhere near there. Who is that? One of my friends said while looking up at the barely visible face, confirming that I wasn't the only one who thought it was nothing more than a crazy person. I think it pissed the animal off that we continued to stand there because it soon shrieked so loudly that it seemed it could damage my eardrum. But let me be clear that this shriek was beyond the capabilities of any human. It was so powerful that it had to have projected across several miles. If anyone happens to be driving by where we were parked, there was just no way they wouldn't have heard it. We all backed away once we watched the animal climb down the tree face first. It was so limber, much like a cat. Once it arrived on the ground, it shrieked once more while staring at us, and then it was off. On two legs, it ran in the direction opposite our campsite. Of course, Elias felt the need to go after it to get a better look. Come on, Elias said. I want to find out what that thing is. What? I said dumbfounded by his bravery. Our other friends also hesitated, but we ultimately silently agreed that it was best to stay together. If I hadn't been with three other guys, I don't think there is any chance I would have gone after the strange animal. A couple of minutes went by where we could hear nothing more than our heavy breathing and footsteps. I think we were all trying to remain silent to get a better idea of whether the animal was on the ground or if it had reclimbed the trees. I have to admit, I was very intimidated by the idea of it dropping down onto one of us. Because why wouldn't an agile predator use tactics like that to capture prey? Eventually, we made it to a ridge and soon heard the sound of medium-sized rocks sliding down the mountainside. Then I noticed a tall silhouette about 30 yards ahead 
of where we were all standing. One of our friends also noticed it because he had shined a small flashlight in the exact location that I saw movement. At first, it looked like there was nothing there other than the tumbling stone, but it was as soon as he redirected the light away from the location that I saw the silhouette rise. Shine it over there again, I commanded of our friend, pointing to the same position on the rocky slope. Hunched over, it moved up the steep incline while occasionally screaming at the four of us. For whatever reason, its eyes no longer appeared to be glowing. It screeched several times while moving up the ridge. The efficiency at which this animal traveled along such a treacherous terrain is still tough to comprehend. It didn't seem like it should be possible. I don't think we would have stuck around to observe any of that if it hadn't been clear that the animal was moving away from us. When it made it onto a ridge, it stood up for a moment and gazed at us before unleashing yet another terrifying scream. I guess it didn't like how we continued to stare at it. And it dropped back onto all fours and lunged headfirst down the slope just below where it was standing. Luckily for us, it seemed to be nothing more than a bluff charge because the animal held its position just below the cliff. It seemed to hang there with such little effort while it stared at us, waiting to see whether we would attempt to come any closer. By this point, we embraced its warning and began to back away. The animal continued to glare at us until we were out of sight. I've always wondered if it might have been hiding its offspring up there, just beyond that ridge. If that were the case, can you imagine what might have happened to us had we decided to climb up there? The four of us made it back to our campsite without hearing another creepy scream, but we were much too shaken up to sleep. Elias was probably the only one who would have dared to stick it out. We were too anxious to deal with packing up the tent, so we decided to let them be until the next day. When we made it back to our cars, one of the guys turned on some music, and I remember how that helped ease my mind a bit. It seemed to calm me down just enough to come back to reality, and we quickly agreed that it had to have been a Sasquatch that we encountered. We stayed in and around our cars, sipping beers, and keeping our eyes out for the animal. While we waited for the sun to rise, I felt so much more secure as soon as it was light enough to see our surrounding, and the four of us made our way back to the campsite. Everything that we left behind appeared to be untouched. I'm not sure why, but I had expected to find the tent ripped to shreds. I guess I've probably seen too many horror movies. We didn't see or hear anything strange while we packed up our things. The environment went back to feeling normal, making it even more difficult to fathom the strangeness of what occurred only hours earlier. Elias was very open with others about the whole experience. He even introduced us to another student who claimed she had seen a family of Sasquatches while walking her dog in her hometown of Northern California. There was something about talking to that girl which, for me, had a way of confirming our experience as reality. It's not like I was wondering whether the four of us had somehow imagined it. It's just that it verified the Sasquatch as a species rather than a single legendary figure. I wish science would put more credible resources toward uncovering the truth behind this very tangible phenomenon. On to the next one. In Galway, Ireland, in January of 1909, a spectral figure, gray in color and about eight feet in height, is said to have haunted the railway line near Galway for the past few nights. The apparition, which is described as tapering toward the top, walks from the railway viaduct across the Corrib River to a point along the bank of the stream and then disappears. A number of people have visited the place toward midnight when the apparition is due to appear. 
One man declares that he saw it jump from the top of the viaduct into the corb where it disappeared. It was not drowned, however, for on the succeeding night it was seen again by a number of students from Queen's College, Galway. One of the students volunteered to go over to talk to it, but when it appeared, the student changed his mind. This is further stated that on Sunday evening, a party of six men armed with shotguns, revolvers, and sticks sailed forth to lay the ghost. They had been in ambush for a short time when the specter loomed before them. One of the men raised a revolver, but before he could fire, he fell into a swoon. The expedition was abandoned, and the man was taken into Galway House, where he was medically attended. These strange reports have created excitement in this district, and search parties are out nightly for the purpose of unraveling the mystery. On to the next one. On March 6, 1910, at 11.30 p.m. at Loch Urn in Fermanagh, the Countess of Urn saw a circular light resembling that of a motor car lamp of the period crossing the lock between the level of the window of Crum Castle. It was yellow, circular, with an apparent diameter of 60 centimeters and only lit up the scenery to its front, not its rear. It disappeared behind trees. On to the next one. On May 10th, 1910, at Caldoff Bay in Donegal, fishermen observed a blue-gray object approaching at a high speed, only about 60 centimeters above the sea, so they feared a collision. It resembled a torpedo boat and had a vaporous appearance and damaged boat in its path. It passed over the shore, then across Caldoff Bay, In July 1910, Captain Jorgensen of the three-masted sail ship Felix reported sighting a sea monster off Rathalin Island, north of Ireland. The creature had a long neck, a small head, and a lumpy body. The ship was traveling from Norway to Canada. The sea serpent had been writhing in the surface for only a short period, and only 14 feet were visible. In autumn of 1910, Mr. Howard St. George and his son were coming home from the sea into Kilcairn Bay in Conmara in Ireland. They had just shot an old gray bull seal about eight feet long, and as they came into the bay, they saw a sea monster floating on the ebb tide about 80 yards away. It was a large brown animal as big as a lorry and had a head and neck moving from side to side. The sight of the sea monster appalled them, and they did not stay around to investigate. On to the next one. Two men encountered strange light near Listowel. Around midnight in the middle of December 1910 in County Kerry, Ireland. They noticed a light about a mile ahead of them. At first, they thought it was simply a light in a house, but on drawing closer, they could see it was moving up and down, to and fro, diminishing to a speck, then expanding into a yellow luminous flame. Before arriving to Lift Owl, they were able to distinguish two lights. Suddenly, both of these expanded into yellow sheets of light about six feet high by four feet across. In the midst of each light, they saw a radiant being having a human form. Only the general shape of the figure could be seen. The lights came together so that the beings could be seen side by side within the bright illumination. A house intervened between the two travelers which were still moving and they saw no more of them. On to the next one. Near Newbridge, in County Kildare, Ireland, at 3 a.m. one day in June of 1912, the witness was awoken at 3 in the morning by the sound of kneeing. 
it suddenly got louder, and it was like a woman or a girl crying. I got up to investigate. The night was very dark, but I could see well through the huts and piles of logs. I plucked up the courage and went out on the old road out of the wood. I could see nothing at first, but after a few seconds, a most awful keen, more like a roar, came from about ten yards in front of me. I was frozen to the ground. Then I could see plainly a woman. She was about four feet high, and I couldn't tell whether she was sitting or standing. Her clothes seemed to be the same color as the beech logs, and her head was covered with a kind of cape. She was moving her hands up and down as she kept on wailing. I ran back to the hut. The following day, I heard that Mr. Kelly, the owner of the old house, had died during the night. On to the next one. On September 1st, 1912, at 9.30 p.m., at Loch Ern at Fermina, the head gardener at Crum Castle saw a yellow light approach him and suddenly disappear. Other people also reported the light. There had been aerial light seen here before as well as that of a strange little man walking on water. On to the next one. On the night of January 1st, 1930, in Enniskillen in Fermina, Miss Finlay twice saw a blue light one meter in diameter traveling between the West Bridge and Old Rossery where it disappeared. The water appeared agitated as it passed over and illuminated it. She saw this on three following days. Near Clare Island in County Mayo in Ireland, one night in January 4th, 1913, a brilliant light was seen traveling between Care Island and Inishirk Island. The local pilot looked through his telescope and saw that it came from a machine in which two men were seated. In late February 1913, in Killary Harbor in Galway, Ireland, a Mr. Collins was aboard his yacht when he saw a strange, aeroplane-like object approach from the sea. It suddenly ditched into the water near the shore. Collins then approached the craft, which was now apparently at the shore. He saw three occupants apparently working on the object. Two were tall, heavy-set, blonde-haired, and light-complexioned. Thinking they were of German origin, he asked if they needed help in German. One of the men responded in French, claiming he could not understand, then, in no uncertain terms, told the witness to leave the area. Collins quickly left and did not see the craft depart. On to the next one. On Sunday, the 14th of January, 1914, a young lady and her kitchen maid saw a lake monster in Loch Absidelay in Galway, Ireland. The creature was 35 feet long, black, and traveling quickly. It had a snake-like, flattish head on top of a long, thick neck which it held aloft. The creature was huge and was propelling itself rapidly across the lake as two great lops of its length buckled in and out of the water. The witnesses had a clear view of the beast from the avenue on the way to church. In the local language, Loch Absidale is called Powell and Gurum, Lake of the Monster, or Lake of the Worm. On to the next one. On Spike Island in Cork Harbor, Ireland, one afternoon in June 1914, the six-year-old witness walking along a path located next to the sea, absorbed in her pastime with her eyes mostly on the ground. She happened to look up when she was about five yards away from a wall of the local doctor house and saw a bizarre, strange figure was looking over the wall across the harbor to Cobb. She walked a few more steps nearer before she realized what it was, and then she became rooted to the ground with fear. 
It was not ten paces away, and she could see it only too clearly. It must have been a very tall creature that was looking over the wall, because she could see almost to its waist, and the wall was at least five feet high. It was in the rough shape of a human being, that is, it had a head and shoulders and arms, though she did not see hands which were behind the wall, except for two dark caverns which represented the eyes, the whole thing was of one color, a sort of glistening yellow, as the wall was parallel to the road, and on her left the thing was looking past her, across the little road, and straight across to Cobb. As the witness stood petrified, the thing began to turn its head very slowly toward her. At this point, the young witness heard a voice in her ear, If it looks straight at you, Eileen, you will die. Her feet seemed to be anchored to the ground by heavy weight, but somehow she managed to turn and run. She ran into a nearby cottage about 15 yards away. Her next memory was, Mrs. Riley, the owner of the cottage, sponging her face with water as she shook all over with shock and terror. She told Miss Riley that she had seen something dreadful in the doctor's garden. Mrs. Riley told the young witness that she was not the first to see it and would not be the last. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!